Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the daily Rambam Shur three prokim per day. Once upon a time, a rabbi came to a community to deliver a speech, and slowly but surely, as he starts and he progresses in the speech, he notices one by one of the congregants fall asleep. He's about, he left with one listener that he was also about to fall asleep at the time. And suddenly, someone walks to the synagogue and stares at the rabbi who is delivering the speech very, with a big attention to him, pays full attention. He was so happy, finally, someone is listening to him. So he continues his speech and suddenly he noticed that this guy nods with the hand like with disagreement to him. He says, aha, I guess this individual he has in mind that whatever I'm saying right now really contradicts an open text in a Talmudical tractate, in this tractate, page 72. It says, so probably you may ask of what I've just said right now from that in particular page. So the answer perhaps can be said that way. And the individual nods with the head with agreement. So he continues on and suddenly he notices again, this guy nods with the hand to the other. So he thinks, ah, he may have a problem. He may have a problem with what I say with a different text in a different book. Perhaps we can answer that way, the other way. And the guy nods with the hand. And so on, it went for about an hour. He introduces an idea, the other person nods with the head, and then nods that way, that the other way. Finally, he concluded the speech. He goes on to that individual, and he says, wow, thank you so much that you were here I finally, I was able to share my deep thoughts, my greatest ideas, with someone of a very high caliber. He says, what are you talking about? I had no idea what you were talking for the last hour. Really? He says, really? So what were you nodding with the head back and forth? Ah, he says, very simple. I had a goat. I lost it a few days ago. And I've been searching and searching. And finally, when I went in, came into this synagogue and I saw you were giving a speech, looked like my God. And I was nodding with the hand that, that way. This is my God. And then I was nodding the other way because no, it's not, it's not, it's not my God. So he says, so what was the conclusion? He says, the conclusion I made is, was very simple. You are a God, but not mine. The reason that I'm introducing it because today, the first chapter of the Rambam of today deals with so many activities, melachot, that are associated with a goat. For example, in the olden days and even today, lots of our garments are being made of wool. In order to produce wool, there are many activities that are taking place from shearing the wool, plowing the wool, spinning the threads, clipping, laundering, washing, painting, all of those activities, they have three levels. Like many of the Melachot of Shabbat that we have introduced them in the last few days and we will continue today and tomorrow. There are three levels of performing them in a criminal way. Which means if an individual committed those activities intentionally and it is a biblical activities, 
So this itself is being divided what type of liability he will carry. If he was violating it while other witnesses were there and warned him, so in a time that there is a betidin, the punishment will be skilat, stoning him. If he was doing it intentionally and he was having no warning, the punishment will be karet. And if he was committing the violation, the desecration of Shabbat unknowingly, so all he need to do is just a animal offering to the temple. It's called the offering of Khatat. Loosely translated, the word Khatat means a sin. Now I will share with you an interesting story that took place about, about a while ago. I would say it was in the late 60s, early 70s. At that time, a rabbi, quiet, popular lecturer in those days, he came to New York for a pgisha. A pgisha was a meeting where college students and other people who are not observing Jews, but not observe verse of Judaism on a daily basis, they came to get to know the life of Jewish observancy. And part of the program, the rabbi that was leading, that was part of the convention, he was interviewed in the radio. In the radio, in New York. And the anchor asked him the following question. Do you really think, do you really think that in our modern days, your Torah is relevant? He says, well, absolutely. So he says, yeah, what's about it says in the Torah that if someone like myself, said the anchor, he was Jewish, who are desecrating the Sabbath, mot yumat, he needs to die. Do you really want to tell me that I am, according to your religion, subject to death? Well, he explained him, you see, in the Torah, there is the oral tradition, there is the Talmud, the world of Halakha, and anybody who learned the rules in Masechet Sanhedrin and in the Rambam itself, in Shoftim, knows that the procedure in order to bring somebody on the death row is so much red tape, so much complexities, so much requirement, because in order for a person to get there and to be executed, not only two kosher witnesses who are not related to each other, who must see instantaneously and simultaneously, and he needs to get the warning and hear the warning and verbally declare that despite the warning, he is consciously violating so. To such an extent that even in the Talmud it said that a bet din, that executing someone once in 70 years, it's considered a very cruel bet din, murderous bet din. So therefore, although in the open text in the Torah it is written that someone who desecrates the Shabbos, Mois Yumos, nevertheless, in reality, to apply this punishment is almost impossible. A week later, or a few days later, the Rebbe in Afarbringen was sharing the news that, thank God, what not thank God, this Hasid who was interviewed in the radio the anchor left him off the hook. He accepted his answer. But he didn't really give him an answer. The answer is only on a practical level. On a practically technicality is not going to allow for someone to be executed. 
but had the anchor would be more sophisticated, he would present him, and what's about the theoretical level? It's true that technically, this individual is not going to get to the death row. But how is it even possible that the Torah, the word of God, that the path of Torah are peaceful path, and all it is there in order to increase generosity and kindness and light, will present a punishment of death to someone who just desecrating the Shabbat. And desecrate the Shabbat, as we have learned the last few days, is quite not that complicated. In fact, sometimes when a person doesn't even know without knowing, he may desecrate the Shabbat quite a bit. At that time, said the Rebbe, God Almighty, by giving us the opportunity to be exposed to the latest developments that are taking place, in this world, there is also lessons we can derive, including to respond to this type of challenge. We're going back at the late 60s, at that time, America have sent to the moon the first Sputnik. And the Rebbe said, this Sputnik can give us a little idea to relate emotionally to this type of question. Obviously, Uncle Sam, the American government, have invested in this project billions of dollars, hired the greatest minds, developed the most sophisticated equipment, really put the best source resources they have on hand towards this project. The protocol that the astronaut needs to follow is very, very, very strict. Just imagine that one of the staff of the astronauts decide for his comfort on inside the shuttle to take a little smoke or to violate the protocol. Any type of response that the government will have about the severity of his act by desecrating and by putting into disrespect the attitude that America, the seriousness that America have put those few dollars, well, it happens to be billions of dollars, will justify any punishment because this person betrays this person he really spits on the importance of the project, which was the pride of the country at the time. So now what we're we talking of here, we're talking about human beings, that the entire investment of resources is a few cents and a few dollars. It happens to be many of them, but still it's limited. Now you're talking over here about the greatest project of all, the entire creation, that was created and is being supervised and continuously being injected with renewal energy on a daily basis. How much more serious this type of project is and how easy it to relate in our minds this type of severe attitude that God Almighty has towards his expectation by us to follow, observe, and preserve this protocol of Shabbat that he gave us. I'm giving this introduction, this story, in order to appreciate what I've just started, which is a general idea that all the activities of the 39 Melachot that we have started yesterday, today, and tomorrow we will continue, they are being divided into three levels of severity. The first level is Mideoaita, biblical prohibition. And as I said, any violation of biblical prohibition, this itself is also being divided into three. If he done it 
intentionally with presence of witnesses and warning, this is the highest level of severity, the punishment is skila, stoning. The second level, if it was done only in presence of witnesses, but no warning were taking place, so then there is the then then there is only only karet which is only a godly punishment and then there is the third level that it was done unintentionally that a person have done it without any intention and the punishment is only korban chatat is a offering that he needs to bring to Beta Mikdash. but this is all the first level of severity then there is what we called forbidden midr abanan and generally the expression that is used in the literature of halakha will be patur aval asur patur he is exempt from any consequences but asur it is forbidden mi de rabanan rabbinically mi de rabanan is a rabbinical prohibition then there is the third level, which is mutar lechatchila. Mutar, it is permitted. Even midrabanan, even rabbinically, they have no problem for a person to go and perform this type of activity. I will zoom in since we started with the story of the goat. So we have, we're speaking about the stages that taking place in order to uh, prepare a garment that we wear. So the first activity is the shearing of the shear plow, shearing plow to cut the wool out of the goat. Now, this is a av melcha. This is the idea of, we spoke yesterday, the father of the melcha which is being extrapolated not only in a case of a goat, but also an individual who cuts his hair. And now there is three ways how for a person to cut his hair. There is one way to cut it or by equipment, a professional way by a scissor or by a knife, which is a biblical prohibition then there is when he cuts it with his hand or with his mouth, with his teeth. Now, while the first one is a biblical prohibition, and therefore any biblical prohibition will be referred to as chayav, liable. The word chayav is a common reference to a biblical prohibition. Then to chop it with the mouth or with the hand, it will be a rabbinical prohibition. So here we saw only two possibilities, but then there is three possibilities. When it comes to chop the nail, clip, cutting the nails. So again, there is three ways how to cut the nail. A person can do it by a clipper, which is the professional equipment to cut the nail, so it is a biblical prohibition and he will be liable based on the level of his intention. Then a person can do it with his teeth, he can cut it, so although he's not going to be liable biblically, but is forbidden rabbinically. And then there is a possibility that it will be permitted to begin with, subject to three conditions that are being met. If an individual, his nails were already, majority of them were chipped, and they are turned, directed to a point towards his flesh, and that position causes him pains, so if there is three conditions are met, A, majority of the nail was already chipped, 
B, it is directed toward his flesh. C, it is causing him pain. Then he will be mutar lechatchila. Mutar lechatchila, he will be permitted to chop it on Shabbat. A second example where an individual will be permitted to remove a, what seemingly, a organic part of his body, when it comes to a Kohen who serves in the temple and part of the service requirement, he should be clean without any blemishes and a mole pops out on his skin. So on Shabbat, he is permitted lechatchila to remove the mole of his skin and continue to serve in the temple. So I was again <coughs> zooming on one example of a type of a melacha, type of activities where you have all three possibilities are being reflected based on the condition, based on the circumstances. A second topic that is being dealt in the first chapter, everybody remembers the eternal words of Queen Antoinette. She said, if there is no bread, let them eat cake. So today we will speak both about bread and about cake. Because the common activity that is required both for cakes and bread is baking. Baking Ofe is one of the 39 forbidden activities. I was selecting and zooming on this activity since throughout analyzing the different dimension and aspects in the melechet, in the activity of ofe, of baking, we're learning a few fundamentals issues in the rules of Shabbat. So first of all, the individual in order for him to violate biblically the Memlechet of Feh, the amount, the minimum amount of food, of bread or cake that must be baked in order for him to be in violation is the measurement of a Gerogeret. Gerogeret <laughs> is a size of a date. A size, a date. Tamar. Yeah? This is the amount that he will be liable when he is baking on Shabbat. Baking is the Av Melacha, as we said, the father, the principal of the activities, but it's not only baking. Any type of fire that is being made in order to cook food or to make fire or to prepare a egg, for example, is also a offshoot of melechet, of the activity of ofe. It is very important to make a distinction between whether the individual was baking with fire, because there is alternatives. How can a person make a cooked food, he can use a fire, and in hot countries, a person, especially in countries that they are have a desert and it's hot in the summer, well, they have winter, but then it's also hot as the summer, they can put an egg inside the ground and the heat of the ground will basically cook the egg. So such an activity it will be examining him biblically from the liability. He's not going to be liable. Reason, since Toldot Chama, the effect of the sun, or the offshoots of the effect of the sun, is not considered to be like the effect of the U of the fire. If an individual cooks via fire or via hot metal surface, which is toldot esh, toldot ha'ur, then he will be liable. If an individual bakes via toldot chama, the so-called the offshoots of the sun, 
it is not going to be, it's called a derivative, a derivative or an offshoot of the sum, he is not going to be liable. But although he is not liable, it is forbidden rabbinically. But there is one activity that will be allowed even rabbinically. And what is the activity? And this is a very important principle that the Rambam states it in one sentence, and around this sentence, quite a large literature has been developed, and they're going into intricacies and into details. The Rambam write the following word sentence. Ein bishul achar bishul be esh. In other words, when it comes to fire, and a fire can or take a liquid item and make it solid, or take a solid item and make it liquid, this is a general activity of a fire, but if an item has been already cooked, and you are cooking it a second time on the fire, so the second time that you have cooked, you're not going to be liable biblically. You are forbidden rabbinically. But given the fact that the Rambam limits the rabbinical prohibition only to fire, implies that if it's not directly to fire, an individual can take a cooked item and cook it again. For that reason, for example, on Shabbat, we are having a cup of coffee. What, what are we doing? We're taking the powder, the coffee, and we're pouring the water, and it's being dissolved. How come it's being dissolved and we're still allowed to benefit? Because again, the coffee grains, they are already cooked. They went through a process of cooking. So since there is no bishul achar bishul, and we are not placing it under fire, we are just taking hot water already, which is, then it is permitted even lechatchila. So again, when it is a direct contact of fire, it is prohibited biblically. When it's not direct contact to fire, it's prohibited rabbinically. And when it is something that already cooked, and on top of it, it's not directly related to fire, it is even permitted lechatchila to begin with. For example, many times, a chala in the morning that is some, that uh, you're putting it next to a, uh, not on the fire, but next to a warm item. So the chala can be warm because it's not considered a uh, bishul, since, as we have learned, based on the principle, ein bishul, achar bishul. In the third chapter, we are dealing with the melacha of tying, kshira. kshira. I will start with a story. Once upon a time, a person for his birthday received a gift from his children. He was an elderly man, angry man, arrogant man, always upset, always nervous. His children wanted to surprise him. So they gave him a new pair of shoes that really fits his size because he was always going with a smaller size. And they thought finally they're gonna make happy. To their surprise that day he was even angrier than usual. They came to him and they says, have you noticed the shoes? Yeah, I noticed. So are you still angry? Yes, even more angrier. He says, really? How come you are angry? He says, I had only one pleasure in my life. Everything in my life was terrible. The only pleasure I had in my life, after an entire day that my foot was squeezed in a size that was below, in a shoe that was too 
numbers below my size and I was releasing it at the end of the day. Ah, what a pleasure. And this only pleasure that I had, you took it away from me by giving me new shoes. So the idea of a shoe comes in the third chapter of today from a few angles. Because in order to make a shoe, there is again three levels of manufacturing the shoe, which is associated also with tying. There is the shoemaker who makes the shoe, who actually ties those sole to the leather in a very professional way. And generally, when we're talking about violating the melacha of kosher, the melacha, the activity of tying, two things are required. It is required, it should be a professional tie and B, kesher shel kayama, a permanent tie. In order to be exposed for the biblical violation, two of those conditions must be met. It must be permanent and it must be professional. If one of them is lacking, so it is again forbidden nidera rabbanan, rabbinically, but patu will be exempt biblically. But then there is a permissible tie. What is a permissible tie? If an individual on Shabbat, he, his soul and his leather, the string that connects them, was chopped, was taken. So he can solve the problem two ways. There is one way to solve. He can use a string and place it in those holes, but then he is not allowed to tie it. But if he ties it, it is not a biblical prohibition. It is only a rabbinical prohibition. But then there is another way that he is even permitted to do it lechatchila. What is the way? If he finds grass and he takes those grass, then even if he ties those grass into his shoes and he puts them together, it will be mutar milechatchila. So that's what I brought over here. Three possibilities of those three levels that are going through each and every one of the lametet melachot that we are um, that we are covering, and the final halacha is a reference to a question that yesterday Rabbi Noson uh, have raised, and in fact I promised him that I will uh, deal with it. And today, while I was preparing this shiur, I saw a perfect example that can illustrate his point that he was raising. The final melacha that is being dealt in the third daily Rambam of today is the activity of writing. The minimum amount that a person will be violating a biblical prohibition by writing if he writes two 